Hi, welcome back to Celebrating Culture. We're here today at Lakefront Airport in New Orleans, Louisiana with the Texas Raiders, and they are part of the commemorative Air Force flying a B-17 flying fortress that goes back 75 years. And I'm with Kevin Michael, who has got many titles here. Kevin, tell me what you do. Okay, well, on the aircraft, when we're flying, I'm a loadmaster, and I take care of everything that's on the aircraft, whether it's fuel, oil, cargo, or passengers and passengers are by far the most fun. I'm also the wing historian, so it's my uh, job to keep track of everything that uh, relates to uh, B-17s in general and Texas Raiders in particular. So tell me, we are actually in the cockpit right now. We are. And this looks like original equipment. Most of this is very original. Everything here, with the exception of just a few items, is exactly what they used to fly this aircraft in 1945 when it came off the production line. The exceptions, and the most obvious, is right here on the ceiling. We've got a Garmin radio and GPS stack. You kind of need to have stuff like that to fly in the modern world. When you're here, you can take a flight. You can fly over New Orleans. Absolutely, and that's always really fun. If you think New Orleans is a great city, you should see it from the air. We start with a safety brief. This is a B-17. This is uh, not only a 1940s aircraft, but it's also a much different type of aircraft than what you would say, you know, flying southwest. You know, we have open windows on this aircraft, which is much different than a pressurized cabin. The different photo opportunities that this gives you but also the dangers of flying at 160 miles an hour with an open window. But some of the opportunities to uh, stick your head out the uh, top window, which I call the sunroof, you should not pass up. And uh, I make sure that everybody gets an opportunity to do that. It's really fantastic. So Kevin, when you're prepping the people, you guys use a little bit of humor. We're a great fun group. We love what we do. And when people come out to take a flight on our aircraft, we understand the reason you're here is to have a great flight. And we're here to make sure that it happens. But safety is our primary concern. We absolutely will not take this aircraft in the air if we even think there might be a problem. This plane has been flying since it was built in 1945. And uh, there were just two brief periods where it did not fly during that time. And it has a unvarnished safety record during that time. You can fly in the front. You can fly as the bombardier spot. You can. If you get sat up there, we have the bombardier and the navigator. Really an opportunity it should never be passed up. The view is unbelievable. An aircraft like this has a clear nose, which you've ever seen a B-17. One of the things that you notice very first is that clear nose. Well, that's how they used to aim bombs was visually. And we have the Norden bomb site in there that they used to do that. Today, bombers don't aim visually, so we don't need that. But the view that that gives you as a passenger is unsurpassed. You got a better uh, view there than the pilots do. And you actually have bombs in here. When people are flying it, it is equipped as if it was going on a mission. We've done a painstaking job of restoring the aircraft to look very much like an 8th Air Force bomber that went into combat in 1944 and 1945, and that's on purpose. The three-part mission of the Commemorative Air Force is to honor, inspire, and educate. We're honoring our veterans that gave us the freedoms that we take for granted every day. We're inspiring the next generation. And most importantly, we're educating everyone as to where all these freedoms came from. How many B-17s are still flying? There were 12,731 built. There were 5,000 lost in combat. Today, there are just five in the world that are still flying. Four of them are here in the U.S. and one is in the United Kingdom. And I'm with John Bixby, who's one of the pilots. John, welcome to the show. Thank you. So John, the B-17 during World War II, I mean, that was the bombing plane. It was. This one seems like it had most of the glory and was the most popular. I mean, that's not to say it was the most effective. They built 12,700 of them. Hundreds, thousands of these things flying over uh, both the European theater and the Pacific theater during the war. When we think about the raids over Germany, this is the plane. This is. When they would do the thousand plane raids that you've heard about, they would take off from air bases all over Europe. Their job was to shut down German manufacturing. Absolutely. They were bombing oil refineries, ball bearing plants, aircraft factories, tank factories, you name it. We had a 10-man crew. We had the top turret with two machine guns. We had the chin turret with two machine guns. We had two uh, cheek guns on either side in the nose, plus these two waist guns, for the two guns down below in the ball turret, plus the two guns back in the tail, hence the term flying fortress. What is it like when those men show up? I mean, we enjoy it. I mean, taking a ride in this thing is really nostalgic. But when you see a gentleman show up that was actually in it. Well, that's becoming rarer and rarer. Yesterday, we had a 101-year-old former C-47 crew chief that came through. And he was just an absolute delight to have through here. And I'm with Ubert Terrell, who was actually a World War II veteran from D-Day. Ubert, welcome to the show, and my honor to have you as a guest. So. Thank you. I parachuted into occupied France at night from England five times before D-Day, picking up information 
But our commanders wanted, and in D-Day, our chief engineer on the troop carrier, C-47, we brought paratroopers at 12 o'clock on Sunday night before D-Day. What did you feel as you got ready knowing that this was the beginning of D-Day? You don't know what's going to happen. You, uh, the bombers had been going over, getting shot up, shot down, before D-Day out of England. It was a journey that I surely wouldn't want to take over, go again. Sure. You and your brothers are such heroes to America. And we meet a lot of veterans where we hear three months, four months later that they've passed. That's a tearjerker for us. The way I, I, I've learned to think about that is we got to them in time. We got to honor them. We got to bring them on our on our aircraft, and we got to meet them and thank them in person. We had a, a veteran come out about three years ago, and he came out in his uh, wheelchair, and he, with that wordless, he didn't introduce himself, didn't do anything. He rolled out to the airplane, and he got out of his chair. Just, I mean, you could tell he needed a wheelchair, and it was really difficult for him to stand up. But he stood out of his wheelchair. I'm tearing up now. Uh, got to the plane. He literally kissed it. So it turns out that this guy had flown uh, 17 combat missions over Europe, the 8th Air Force. On his 18th mission, he was shot down. But he got all the combat damage over Germany. He had three engines out. B-17 on one engine got him over friendly territory, and he was able to control land. There's very few aircraft that will give you a controlled landing on three quarters of your engines out. And B-17 can do that. So the B-17, in his view, saved his life. How big is the commemorative Air Force? We are about 10,000 members nationwide, actually worldwide. We've got two wings that are uh, in the international space now. We have 171 aircraft here in New Orleans. We've got a, a steerman, and you can come out and see that today and basically any time. The wing is based right here at Lakefront Airport. You guys recently were in Opelousas, Louisiana, which is a small town, but it seemed like the crowd was really there. So when we have people in Opelousas or any other city come out and see the plane, we make sure that they get a great experience. It's very important to us. I mean, we're all volunteers here. None of of us get paid to do what we do and it, that's you know from the guy that, that just joined and you know is basically just the go-getter right up to our wing leader none of us get paid a dollar but we're all here as a labor of love you guys raise a lot of money so we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization which means that all the money that we take in goes to keeping this aircraft airborne and it takes a surprising amount of money to do that as far as knowledge my mission of the last three years is to create a lot of a basis of correct knowledge because there are so many myths out there about the B-17 and World War II in general. Now you dispelled for me today a myth about the whole nine yards. I did, yes, and that's one of the most pervasive myths out there about World War II, and that is the whole nine yards, and most people have heard about it. That myth has nothing to do with World War II. It certainly has nothing to do with a P-51 or a B-17, and there's many reasons for that. A M-2 air-cooled machine gun could never fire a nine-yard belt of ammunition without self-destructing. The barrel would melt, it would droop down, and you'd be gone. And even if you could, you know, why would you fire all of your ammunition at one fighter? What's going to protect you against the next one that comes around? It's definitely an urban legend. Definitely so, an urban legend. If someone wants to know more about all the history and know more about the wing, what's your website? Okay, our website is b17texasraiders.org. And if you want to join the wing, which you can do, I actually live in Colorado. I don't live anywhere near Houston. So, you know, you don't need to live in Houston to be a member. Kevin, I want to thank you for being on the show. And stay tuned. We'll be right back with more of Celebrating Culture.